Um, hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us uh, today for this webinar on implementing the Arctic Research Plan 2022 to 2026. My name is Nikush Carlo. I'm Koya Khan Athabaskan from the Interior Region of Alaska, the CEO of CNC North Consulting, and the IARPIC Plan Development Director for um, the 2022 to 2026 plan. And now I uh, am serving as a senior advisor to IARPIC. So first, I want to share with you why I'm excited about this new Arctic Research Plan. I'm very passionate about um, work to include people who might not otherwise be heard, whether that's indigenous leadership, knowledge, problem solving, and solutions in processes that guide the delivery and use of resources. In this particular topic of Arctic research, communities in Alaska have firsthand, on the ground, and in some cases, multi-generational knowledge and experience that is critical to, excuse me, critical to informing how research is conducted, on what topics, and how the results can be used for their own decision making. So IARPIC is aiming to be more responsive to Arctic communities by engaging, by listening, and by including their ideas when identifying strategic priorities. So the Arctic Research Plan puts in place the mechanism support, to support equity in research and climate change solutions. So today, um, in our session today, we'll provide a brief overview of IARPIC um, and also the Arctic Research Plan, and we'll go into detail about how the plan will be implemented. After the presentation, uh, we'll have a um, discussion, um, uh, take some Q&A, um, and see what you'd like um, to um, see regarding the plan's implementation. So that Q&A sort of discussion piece will be about um, 20 minutes, and then we're going to break into um, breakout rooms. So I'll keep an eye on the time. Um, we want to leave 25 minutes or so for, for breakout rooms um, at the end so that you can uh, talk to specific transition teams. So before we get started, um, I'm going to ask our panelists to introduce themselves um, and in a sentence or two um, say a little bit about what brings them here today. I can just get Maze Kachoko, maybe you could go you're first on my right. You're also directly to my right in this in the camera, but also first on the, the list. Of course. Um, hi, my name is Shoko Shinbrat. I'm a AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow. Um, and I'm at the National Science Foundation in the Office of Polar Programs. Um, and I'm coming here today to talk about um, community health and resilience. Um, and I'm really excited to hear some feedback. Thanks. Mike Falkowski. Yeah, hello everyone. Mike Falkowski, I'm a program manager at NASA headquarters in DC. I'm in the Earth Science Division and I uh, help manage the terrestrial ecology program. Um, and one of the things in our program there at NASA and the Terrestrial Ecology Program is the Arctic and Boreal Vulnerability Experiment, otherwise known as ABOVE. And um, I'm here today to talk about Priority Area 2 and, and hear um, from, from you all about certain things that we should think about focusing on in Priority Area 2, which is Arctic Systems Interactions. George Rowe. Hi, it's George Rowe from the U.S. Department of Energy, Arctic Energy Office, representing the broader DOE uh, with an emphasis in Priority Area 3, which is focused on sustainable economies and livelihoods. John Beemeyer. Hi, John Beemeyer with the Department of Homeland Security Science and Technology Directorate. I'm one of the co-leads on today for Priority Area 4, which relates to risk management and hazard mitigation. Tom Douglas. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome from my daughter's uh, fairy themed bedroom here in Fairbanks. Uh, I'm Tom Douglas with the US Army Coal Regions Lab, and uh, I'm also part of PA4, and I look forward to chatting with folks. Thank you. Uh, Crystal Leonetti. Hi, welcome uh, everybody. G Skugula. My UPIC name is G Skook. I also go by Crystal Leonetti. And I am coming to you from Bagayakak or Anchorage here on the homelands of the Denina peoples. I am the Alaska Native Affairs Specialist for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and one of the co-leads for uh, participatory, re par participatory research and Indigenous leadership in research. Thanks. Uh, 
John Pierce. Uh, good morning, everyone. This is John Pierce from the USGS Alaska Science Center. I'm also calling in from Denina Lands um, in South Central Alaska. And I'm Associate Center Director for Ecosystems Research. So I manage the Ecosystems Research Program at the Alaska Science Center. And I'm working with Crystal Leonetti on the Participatory and Indigenous Leadership and Research Foundational Activity. And I'm just really excited by this plan about the option opportunities for collaboration and inclusiveness um, in the Arctic research endeavor. Thanks. Thanks. Shushin Davis. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Susan Davis uh, from the uh, Department of Energy. Uh, I'm the manager of managing the Earth's model development program area uh, in DOE of the science. I'm here today as a co-lead of the fundamental activity called a monitoring, observing, modeling, and prediction or MOP. Uh, so I look forward to your input on how uh, MOP can um, go forward to coordinate uh, uh, observing and modeling efforts in has uh, RT research. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm, is Kaya on? I know she was going to be a little bit late, and I didn't. She is not here yet. I didn't see her. OK, great. Well, when Kaya um, is presenting, um, maybe she will introduce herself then. So um, great to see some familiar um, faces uh, in the audience. And I also see some that are, are new. Um, so. Um, Thank you all for, I see some of you introducing yourselves in the chat. Please continue to, to do that. That's great. Um, and add um, where you're at, um, anything you want us to know. It's really wonderful to see so many people from, from different places. Um, so I wanted to start with a brief overview of IARPIC. Um, IARPIC stands for the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee and it's part of the National Science and Technology Council. So IARPIC sits within the White House. Um, IARPIC is tasked with enhancing research in the Arctic, both by um, bringing together federal agencies to coordinate their work, um, but also by facilitating conversation among federal agencies, researchers, Arctic communities, and others who live and work in the Arctic. So to do this, we bring together leaders from 16 agencies, departments, and offices across the federal government. Uh, we also run IARPIC uh, Collaboration, which is a web platform that facilitates collaboration uh, between federal agencies and also um, non-fed that have an interest in the, in, in the region. So if you're not already a member, I encourage you to visit IARPIC Collaborations, that's I-A-R-P-C, um, collaborations.org and sign up for a free account. And that, that link is in the chat as well. So every five years, IARCIC put together a new Arctic research plan in collaboration with federal agencies and the Arctic research um, community. And on the next, next slide, going to the cover. Yes, and now this is, this is the cover of the um, new Arctic research plan. As all of you likely are very familiar with the fact that the Arctic is, rap is the most rapidly changing region on Earth. Um, the region is experiencing unprecedented warming at a faster rate than anywhere else on the planet. So climate change impacts the ability of Arctic communities to harvest food, uh, to travel safely. It poses major threats to infrastructure, to housing and economic development. And what is happening in the Arctic has huge implications for the rest of the world. So to just name a few factors, melting glaciers lead to sea level rise that threatens coastal communities. Thawing uh, permafrost releases greenhouse gases that accelerate global warming and melting sea ice can no longer reflect heat away from the planet. So the new Arctic research plan provides a bold vision for Arctic agencies to nimbly and collaboratively help understand and support resilience in the face of these changes. The rate at which new challenges are merging in the Arctic require quick and decisive action. The Arctic Research Plan aims to deliver science and knowledge to decision makers in the Arctic and the beyond. The plan provides pathways to again, improve coordination among federal agencies working in the Arctic, as well as to strengthen relationships between federal agencies and indigenous communities 
academia, and non-federal researchers, the state of Alaska, nonprofits, and the private sector and international organizations. So this graphic here is the report cover, and it reflects this more holistic approach that I've been talking about. And many thanks to artist Molly um, Trainer from Nome, Alaska for the really detailed um, center uh, illustration and to Eric Klein um, for the overall graphic graphic design. Um, and if, I have, if you haven't had a chance to download um, the plan and, and zoom in and take a look at the graphic, graphic, I really encourage you to do so. There's all kinds of little details there and um, they're really wonderful and I discover something new every time I look at it. So I, uh, Check it out. Um, on this next slide, you'll um, this is the um, uh, what we call the plant framework graphic. We did use this um, quite a bit during the plan development process, so it'll look familiar to you. Though it has been updated, and this shows the structure of of the plan. The top section um, shows four policy drivers. That is areas where Arctic research support U.S. policy, um, and these directly connect to other elements of the plan. In the center, in red, you'll see four priority areas with icons that indicate which policy driver they support. The priority areas represent areas of broad cross-cutting research focus, um, and each has a goal that drives the plan. Priority areas are community resilience and health, ecosystems interactions, sustainable economies and livelihoods, and risk management and hazard mitigation. Below, below the priority areas in blue are the foundation activities. Um, these activities are essential to achieving the priority areas and will remain foundational to Arctic research beyond the duration um, of the, the five-year duration of the plan. The foundational activities are data management, education, training, and capacity building, monitoring, observing, modeling, and prediction, participatory research, and indigenous leadership and in research, and technology innovation and application. Finally, in the very um, center, you'll see the IARPIC logo. That's the iceberg in the, in the very middle. And this re represents the IARPIC collaboration platform, which what we'll, is what we'll use to put the plan into action. As we all know, the Arctic is changing at an unprecedented rate. While planning on a five-year um, cycle allows us to be relatively nimble, things change, are changing very quickly. Um, and novel challenges, like for example, the COVID-19 pandemic arise even within the five-year um, time period. So with that in mind, IARPIC is moving to a biennial implementation process for the plan. So while the Arctic Research Plan 2022 to 2020 Six provides this high-level strategy and goals. There will be two-year implementation plans that are more granular, granular uh, provide more specifics, and provide tangible objectives and deliverables. Um, so the planning structure will also provide more opportunities for Arctic researchers and residents to drive the work that we do. The first biennial implementation plan will cover 2022 2022 through 2024, um, and will be released in, in the fall, September, October of this year. Uh, transition teams are currently working on the first plan and are asking for input about what to um, what should be included or what can potentially include. So my colleague, Serena Salat, is she's taking notes. Um, and we'll make sure any feedback today um, that we receive today will, will be shared with um, the transition team. In addition, um, you can send ideas via a Google form, and I think Liz is going to put, or someone's going to put the, um, the short link, tinyurl.com slash BIP dash input. Um, I think she's going to put that in the chat um, so you have access to that. Thanks, Liz. Um, so this is a really exciting time to be involved with IARPIC. Um, as we are making a shift towards implementing the, Arctic the new Arctic Research Plan. So we see this new approach to implementation as a really big step in being more responsive to emerging research questions and to engage new people from across the federal agencies as well as by outside of the federal government. So now I'm going to hand um, 
things off to our transition team leaders who are going to discuss um, particular objectives they are considering for the biennial implementation plans. Um, and I'm not sure who's going <laughs> next. So either someone can help me or, or I think it's me. <laughs> Shoko, you can you okay, can take it away. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thanks so much for that uh, really thoughtful introduction. Um, again, my name is Shoko Shinbratz, and I'm at the National Science Foundation. I neglected to say that I am currently living and working on the traditional territories of the Piscataway people. Um, and I'm here representing priority area one um, on community resilience and health. Sorry about the background noise, uh, which is co-led by uh, David Pear of uh, the Department of the Interior and Suzanne Van Drunick of um, the Environmental Protection Agency. But our team comprises representatives um, from DHHS and CDC and others. Um, and our goal as um, uh, defined by the preliminary plan, you can see on the screen, so it's to improve community resilience and well-being by strengthening research and developing tools to increase understanding of interdependent social, natural, and built systems in the Arctic. Um, and at the core of that is this, uh, sorry, resilient, community resilience um, and well-being, where resilience is defined as uh, the ability of communities to recover and thrive um, during and after disturbances, and well-being is defined as the holistic understanding of health to include um, not just physical well-being, but also mental and spiritual well-being. Uh, next slide, please, thank you. Um, so with, with that goal in mind, our team has identified uh, four preliminary draft focus areas um, just to help guide some of this public engagement. Um, and they're here on the screen again. They include uh, food safety and security, um, where you know some of the uh, areas of interest include food safety and security for both subsistence and market-based foods. Um, the second one being physical and mental health, where a potential objective might be to support physical and mental health of Arctic residents through research on public health needs and disparities and deliverables, excuse me, delivery. And um, sorry, the third one is on cultural well-being and resilience to support integrative approaches. And finally, um, access to safe and reliable infrastructure with relevance to human health and well-being. Um, so these are just a few examples, and we really look forward to receiving feedback on any and all parts um, of these, you know, thinking about what deserves focus, what's missing, what data and tools are needed. So thank you so much. I'll leave it at that for now and hand it off to priority area two. All right. Thanks, Shoko. Um, yeah, my name is Mike Falkowski, and I'm, I was one of the leads for writing Priority Area 2, and I'm one of the, the co-leads for the transition team for um, writing the biennial implementation plan. So my other co-leads are Scott, Scott Harper from the Department of Defense, uh, Renew Joseph from the Department of Energy, Colleen Hafke from the National Science Foundation, as well as David Allen and David Legler from the Department of Commerce. Uh, so as you can see, Priority Area 2 is entitled Arctic Systems Interactions, and, and the goal is to enhance our ability to observe, understand, predict, and project the Arctic's dynamic interconnected systems and their links to the Earth system. So as you can see from that title on the goal, uh, this is a fairly broad topic area, and, and we intentionally did that as we hope it will give us uh, latitude in pursuing a range of activities. Uh, and also make it easier to adapt and pursue emerging areas of research as, as the plan period progresses. It's also worth pointing out that much of what was covered in the last Arctic research plan has been rolled up all into this one priority area. So this, this again, is a very broad area. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? So as it sits now, we've been working towards developing ideas, research ideas to pursue under three fairly broad focus areas. Uh, the first focus area is research focused on characterizing and understanding Arctic ecosystem change, and this includes uh, terrestrial, freshwater, and marine environments. Uh, the second area is, is research focused on Arctic understanding Arctic amplification and, and connections to mid-latitudes. So again, this is a fairly broad area that could include more focused efforts on things like understanding phenomena, uh, such as implication, impl implications of Arctic change on ocean circulation, 
Arctic amplification and the impacts on extreme weather events and the impact of uh, the Arctic on mid-latitude weather and climate. Um, so th these are just a few of the areas under there. There's, there's several other things that we, we could pursue. Uh, and then the third focus area is, is research on ice, atmosphere, ocean, and land interactions. Uh, and so again, this is fairly broad and there's, there's plenty of efforts that could fall under this area, including uh, the roles of multi-scale effects in Arctic systems and processes changes in terrestrial snow cover and impacts on ecosystems, wildlife and human populations, the roles of sea ice and ocean and ecosystem and, and as well as human health and food security, as well as the research research on the dynamics uh, and evolution of the Greenland ice sheet and interactions between the ice sheet, ocean and atmosphere and connections to to global sea level rise. So right now, as with the other the other priority areas, we're in the process of soliciting additional air ideas to, to further pursue and then further re refine the ideas that we already have through through webinars, webinars such as this one. So thank you. We're to pri priority area three now. Thanks very much. It's George Rowe, Arctic Energy Office, uh, DOE. So the focus for priority area three is, is trying to, to identify how people want to live in this environment that is going to be part of our future. And that call involves economies that involve cash, cash economies, and, and just livelihoods, subsistence activities, et cetera. So different kinds of demographics, et cetera. It intends to not be redundant to the work in the other priority areas, but in, but in fact, to, to provide lenses that help those, those areas focus on the well-being of the people in these communities uh, that that we're looking at, and also to uh, complement them in terms of providing uh, feedback and, and reinforcement to the, the work and the engagement that they're doing. So the specific areas that we're looking at right now and that we'd love to get feedback on is identified in the next slide here. The, the, the idea of understanding the natural environment, the ecosystem, how it supports the, the animals, the, the vegetation, that, that it is part of the, the livelihood for, for living in uh, rural and other parts of Alaska, uh, looking at what are the trends gonna be? So, so building on the insights from priority areas one and two there. And then looking at some of the things that you'll hear from priority area four immediately afterward, as you look at uh, disaster, whether they're, it's long or you know, long term or short term hack, acting disasters on infrastructure. What kind of infrastructure do we need to support and how, how does that integrate in to the, the well being of, of communities? We want to understand as people live in their communities for the foreseeable future, how, how would they like to be interacting with the ongoing research and how would they leverage the data that's emerged? Uh, that's emerging through that to help them with their, their plans for their, their community, their region the individually. And then how are, how are people desiring to access information that's generated, whether through this priority area or others? How, how do we keep people? Uh, how do we keep place at the center of, of this research? What, what, what kind of research focus areas? How do we focus that to help us address that overarching topic area. So Tom, I think you're taking us into priority report. All right, thanks, George. Um, actually, John, is. John will be, yeah. Um, so John B. Meyer again with Department of Homeland Security. Um, my other co-leads, uh, Tom Douglas, who's on the line here, and Stephen Gray from the Department of Interior, who uh, unfortunately couldn't join us today. Um, we are the co-leads for priority area four, which is risk management and hazard mitigation. Um, the goal, as you can see here, is to secure and improve quality of life through research that promotes an understanding of disaster risk exposure, sensitivity to hazard, and adaptive capacity. Uh, really looking at how do we strengthen safety and security and community resilience to hazards um, with that emphasis on, on risk management and preparedness. Uh, next slide, please. So in thinking about research uh, to, to reach that goal, um, our, our group has really been focused on um, what type of data and tools are needed to, to do that. And um, looking at 
the three areas listed there, chronic hazards, acute and episodic events, and threats to national security. How do the, the data needs and tool needs um, apply to those different areas? Where are they maybe similar? Where are they different? Um, and, and really with the question that we're looking to understand are, are where are the focus areas within those three that, that this research plan should be focused on? Um, next slide, please. So with that general question in mind, um, our group has, has, has um, coalesced around a couple of focus areas here. Um, the first one is really um, encouraging access and assess and, and um, application of tools, data collection, remote sensing and monitoring, information technologies to increase an understanding of Arctic ecosystems for mitigation, planning, and response purposes. Um, focus on increasing our understanding of linkages between ecosystem changes and hazards and, and community health and well being. And then finally, focus on examining the relationship between climate related hazards and infrastructures, uh, both in the effect of, of those hazards on the infrastructure and also the effect hazard or infrastructure could have on, on how we handle or, or, or respond to hazards. Um, and so these are our thoughts. We look forward to hearing um, from the group later and in the, in the breakout room. Um, really trying to understand, you know, within these, these areas, are we maybe missing something? Um, and going back to that focus on data and tools, you know, where, where should we be focusing in um, to improve research capability that will ultimately improve uh, capability to respond and, and be resilient to uh, both episodic and, and chronic um, hazards within the Arctic region? Um, thank you, and turn it over to the next group. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> My name is Serena Stella. I'm with IRBIC, and I'm working across all these different teams to help develop the biennial implementation plan. I'm going to start off speaking to the data management foundational activity. Um, if you could go to that slide, please. So I, I I'll be speaking for the, the data team quickly here today because unfortunately um, they could not attend, but the data team includes Mike Brady from the Department of Homeland Security and Alan Pope from the National Science Foundation. So the core objective that the data team has been discussing is to explore fair and care principles to gain a collective perspective on what they mean for data management in the Arctic context. So FAIR being findable, accessible, inter accessible, interoperable, and reusable, and CARE being collective benefit, authority to control, responsibility, and ethics. So under this, some potential activities that they have been discussing include hosting discussions on FAIR and CARE to explore where they're mutually reinforcing, where there may be trade-offs when designing and implementing data management system and using these guiding principles. They also have talked about ways to include creating written summaries of the discussions for data managers and others to consider. Next slide, please. They, um, they're also exploring objectives based on um, special topics that will be defined in collaboration with other teams. Um, these include collaboration on training materials and guidance, uh, open science, and data licensing. They're also have, they've also been discussing data for coastal erosion risk in the U.S., um, Arctic, as well as local community perspectives on crowdsourced bathymetry and more, um, and other ideas based on feedback and input that have been received so far and will be continued to be received over the uh, coming months. And then next slide, please. I'm not sure if Kaya has joined yet. Um, Liz, do you know? She's still, I think she's still running late. Oh, wait, right. she's joining literally right now. Okay, I can cover <laughs> if, if she's not ready. Hey, Kaya, we just got to the education slide. Do you feel comfortable jumping in? Sure, no problem. Um, so, so uh, not quite sure how to launch in here, but if you literally just got to the education slide, then I can uh, offer up that we have identified three um, objectives so far, looking, of course, for feedback from uh, folks to either refine these or um, modify, substitute. Um, but these three are providing community access to information about 
existing STEM uh, internships and career pathways that are provided um, already by various federal agencies, but um, maybe not are uh, communicated uh, broadly across the Arctic and continue to gather feedback from communities. We've done some of that with um, an Arctic STEM workshop that we held in April of last year that had quite a broad participation and got a lot of feedback from communities looking to continue to uh, engage with communities. And lastly, to create a community of practice among those interested in STEM and STEM careers, in particular promoting those uh, types of careers for rural and Indigenous students. I hope that met the need. That's perfect. Thank you, Kaya. Hi, Kaya. Yes. Uh, hi. Uh, yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, again, my, my name is Cynthia Davis uh, from UOE, uh, program manager for the Earth System Model Development Program Area. Uh, the other colleague is Sally McFarlane, also from UOE, managing the UOE ARM uh, observation program. Uh, we also have representatives from uh, other agencies uh, on this team, uh, including uh, Roberto Delgado from NSF, who was also one of the colleagues at the beginning, uh, and he continues to represent NSF on this. Uh, we also have representative from NAWA, uh, David Allen, uh, Jessica Cross, and uh, uh, Bushuk uh, Mitchell, uh, and also uh, South Marcus from, from NASA. Uh, we also in contact with other agencies. Uh, so um, uh, first of all, I want to uh, just to uh, say that uh, it's clear that the monitoring here uh, means uh, kind of it, it is a subset of observing that um, referring to uh, observing specific specific variables over a period of time to detect change. And prediction is a subset of modeling uh, that use climate model, use uh, numerical models uh, to estimate uh, the change of Arctic and sub uh, uh, systems. Uh, so in this, uh, our goal is to uh, coordinate existing observing and modeling uh, activities and the community practice to uh, best advance our research and identify uh, gaps as uh, support priority areas. So specifically, we have the uh, following uh, uh, kind of objectives um, to coordinate activities uh, and communities of practice to best uh, synthesis observations and modeling to advance our research. Uh, we also um, will, uh, will, will conduct assessment and gap analysis uh, to understand uh, the needs in uh, observation and modeling efforts. Uh, we also um, will increase the correlation and engagement between uh, federal activities and non-federal uh, uh, activities, um, also con uh, conducting uh, the uh, MOP type of research in the Arctic. Next, please. Yeah, as uh, mentioned briefly earlier, we will support the, and promote the best practice uh, in field observations and, and modeling. And uh, last, but very importantly, uh, to make sure uh, uh, MOP continue uh, as a fundamental uh, uh, activity, uh, we will support uh, continued development of observational and modeling capabilities uh, because the uh, priority area scientific question may change over time the uh, fundamental activities uh, mean support to last uh, for a long time to support our research. And I uh, look forward to your input. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm honored to co-lead this foundational activity on participatory research and indigenous leadership in research with Maya Katak Lukin. Anupiak, originally from Sisalik and Kikiktagruk, also known as Kotzebue, Alaska. Uh, participatory and indigenous leadership in research means we go beyond informing tribal leaders and indigenous knowledge bearers. It can go beyond consent and into full participation. We're working with NIRPIC to ensure that all federal agencies adhere to their consultation responsibilities and engage with tribes, Alaska Native corporations, and Alaska Native organizations in ways that are meaningful and at the level that the tribe is looking for. 
<clears throat> the participatory and indigenous leadership and research concept is embedded in the Arctic Research Plan, and we're excited to ensure that we make this a reality. This activity spans all priority areas of the Arctic Research Plan, <clears throat> and it reminds us to respect sovereignty, self-determination, and it strives to bring together knowledge systems in an equitable way. In the future, we envision that research activities can be informed by indigenous knowledge and the needs of indigenous communities. I express my appreciation to you for your guidance today so that this um, participatory and indigenous leadership in research will become more meaningful through this plan. Uh, Don Pierce from USGS is also a point of contact for this foundational activity and he's gonna tell you more about this graphic. Thanks, Crystal. So uh, this graphic just represents the many different forms that participatory research can take. So at a lesser degree, um, there's inform and in communicating, which is about sharing research plans and findings. And then to a de greater degree on the far right is full co-production, which means full participation of all aspects of a project by all partners and specifically by Arctic residents and indigenous peoples uh, when we're talking about the this Arctic research plan. And so through this foundational activity, as Crystal mentioned, you know, IRPA would like to see that research activities move away from just informing because that can really be just one directional and may not always listen and address the needs and rights of Arctic communities. Um, and we're also getting great feedback thus far from the presentations we've done on this graphic um, about this graphic and how there are other dimensions to it and how it can go even further to the right off the graphic. Um, and then also we're hearing about, you know, where's the space for decision making um, in through this spectrum of participa participation. So we really appreciate that initial feedback and look forward to more feedback um, on this graphic. Um, and we've been posing these two broad questions to everyone that we've been presenting this to um, that are shown at the bottom of the slide. So we really appreciate some input on those questions as well. Thanks. Thank you to all of our presenters. As a reminder, here are some of the key um, links um, that you might want to keep on hand. You can read the full Arctic Research Plan at iarpiccollaborations.org/plan. Um, if you'd like to submit ideas for objectives and deliverables, you can use the form at tinyurl.com/bip-input. We're also taking notes today, and we'll make sure to pass on any ideas along to the relevant um, transition teams and foundational activities. So um, you can keep up with IARPIC on Facebook, uh, also on Twitter, and email plan at iarpiccollaborations.org with any questions. Thanks again, everyone. Um, so now I think we have some time, um, 15 minutes or so, um, to open up the floor for um, questions or comments. You can enter questions um, in the chat. You can use the raise hand function if you'd like to speak, and we'll try to alternate between um, the two of those. So um, if you have any questions about the biennial implementation plan process, or if you have ideas, um, we'd love to hear those. We'd also like to hear what you think the most important research, research questions are for the next two years. Um, and as I said, we'll be taking notes um, on any ideas shared here today. So I think um, as people are thinking about their questions or any comments, I think we have a poll. Liz, is that true? Yes. We have a poll to great gauge interest um, in the various priority areas and foundational activities. So that should be up on your screen if you're connected in that in that way. And while folks are, are filling out the poll, please do feel free to put questions or comments in the chat um, or raise your hand if there's something in particular you would like to say. We'd love to hear from you.
seeing a lot of interest across the board, which is cool to see. Um, presenters, you're you're welcome to respond to the poll, but you also don't have to, since I think we presume that you are a fan of your particular priority area or foundational activity. Um, so I'll give folks another 10 seconds to respond. Um, you should be able to see the results now. And yeah, a lot of interest across the board. Um, I think especially the Arctic systems interactions um, and the modeling, observing, model, monitoring, observing, modeling, and prediction, as well as participatory research and indigenous leadership and research. Great, thanks everyone for filling that out. And it's really good to see how much interest there is across the, the priority areas and the uh, foundational activities. Are there any questions or, or comments? Akush, do we know how many people actually provided inputs to the poll? Yes, we had 26 people voting. We could also invite the team leaders if you have specific questions that you'd like to reiterate, um, things that you'd like to hear from the audience. And this would be a great time to to offer that forward as well. Um, I know, for example, one question that um, has has come up for a number of different. Um, priority areas is that question of food safety and security. Um, so maybe, you know, to ask the audience, what do you consider the greatest challenges to food safety and security for, for Arctic residents relying on marine and coastal challenges? You know, what are, what challenges are, you, I'm sorry, marine and coastal resources? You know, what challenges are you seeing and, and what research do we need? thoughts about that or is it okay. everyone excited oh there's Kathy okay go ahead Kathy yeah hi I think there you know I think there would be a, a lot of potential topics but <clears throat> something that's come up uh fairly recently um I'd say in the last year or two and, and this is in discussion with some of the co-management groups <clears throat> namely the Alaska Eskimo Whaling Commission is <clears throat> a concern about the impacts of uh, research itself um, and for their perspective um, so that could be you know land or marine land coastal marine but i think from their perspective is the impact of um, you know noise and uh, you know uh, movements of whales and uh, you know so in addition to food security and, and health and safety uh, there are you know i think uh, practical practical uh, things that some of the communities are concerned about, like in addition to pollutants and contaminants. Thanks, Kathy. Any follow-up comments or other questions? I have a random one. People, oh, sorry. People always vote data is really low. I guess data aren't exciting. And yet that's what we need to make decisions and whatnot. So I, just a random comment. Is there a way to make data more interesting? I, I think one key thing our ARPIC is supposed to do is make sure we're not 
overworking in some areas and underworking in others and whatnot. And, and obviously data and tracking that is one key piece. Um, I don't have an answer, but unfortunately data management type things always get rated super low. And how do we change that? It's something I heard a lot about during the plan development process. So um, it's again, you know, one of those foundational foundational areas that really extends and, and, and build a base from which to um, uh, support um, a lot of different things, as you know. Yeah, maybe I'll just add to what Nikush is saying briefly and say that it really comes up a lot in the different priority area meetings is really important and foundational um, to those priority areas. So um, we definitely see its importance and relevance, but definitely hearing your point about making it relevant and engaging um, as an activity. Pujing? Yeah, also, uh, Tom's point, I think uh, the uh, data, data from mental activity has a natural co connection to the uh, MOP too. I mean, in manual objectives, we, we mentioned to uh, synthesize, uh, synthesize uh, uh, I mean, observational data and model, and possibly can data simulation provide uh, data to the science community. Um, yeah. Um, in addition to address uh, Tom's question, I also just want to encourage uh, um, the participants uh, doing art research, you you must have been I mean, using either observation or model to do research. So please uh, just think of uh, how uh, IR pick is a great uh, kind of uh, an, um, platform. How can uh, IR pick uh, I mean mob team help you to best I mean uh, advance your scientific research? Just think of that and uh, yeah, important input. Thanks. Kathy, is your hand still up or do you have? Okay, great. Um, David? Yeah, hi, thanks. Uh, yeah, to follow up on that, on the discussion of data, I'm really intrigued by the, the idea of the, the fair and care principles and where you see those like sort of aligning with each other and where the uh, potential conflicts arise and how we might resolve that with, you know, a, a goal of having open and freely accessible data while um, respecting intellectual property and particularly when, um, when we're, we're dealing in a participatory framework with um, uh, data that's, that's owned by, by, by residents of the Arctic, how, how we can sort of meld those principles. And if anybody has any thoughts on that. <clears throat> Thanks, David. Any of the, um, is there any other comments about that? Unfortunately, I think we do, don't have any, we don't have a representative from the data management um, area on, on, the, on the call today, but um, I think Serena and others are yeah. making notes, so we'll make mm -hmm. sure that, that these questions um, that you zeroed on in on are, are, are highlighted for them and, and they get that information. Serena, did you? Yeah, I just wanted to thank you, Dave, for your comment. Um, those points you raised are being discussed by the data team. I think they're really central to this discussion. And again and again in this conversation, the importance of the data team specifically on this topic, but as well as on other topics, the importance of working very closely with the participatory research and indigenous leadership in research team. Um, I'm not sure that connection, I believe that connection hasn't quite been made, um, but very shortly um, the data team will be reaching out to the participatory research team because it, it is a very important connection to, and um, yeah, to make early on as well before the objective is, is defined. And I will take that comment back to the data team. Debo, I see you have a hand up. Yeah, um, so my comment um, may also just be because I'm relatively new to the group when it comes to, you know, um, thinking about how the data piece connects. Um, and I, I think we'd all agree here that they, we, we all recognize that data is ex exceptionally important um, across all of the work. I, th I think um, 
possibly when when we see the way the um, objectives are laid out for the uh, the data foundational activity, it it does appear you know very um, you know very specific and very technical <laughs> in, in such a way that it may sometimes be difficult for some of us to be able to connect that back to the uh, more you know the topical areas that we're we're working on in terms of the priority areas so i, I think um maybe that's where there's a bit of um you know maybe just a little bit more bridging needs to be done there and i think maybe that's why some of us don't feel as um maybe maybe as confident in in identifying exactly how we connect on the specific uh, research objectives laid out by that foundational activity team. Thanks, Nigel, for that for that feedback. Catherine, oh, I see. Catherine, yeah, I, I um, certainly agree with uh, Debo's point, and was thinking just along the same lines. For for those of us who are are not quants or, or data experts, we might still be able to say, what, what are the issues? Food security is an issue. Um, health is an issue. And, and what sort of information, what sort of data would we like to have to apply to that issue to help address it? And, and then the people who are much more savvy at extracting this data can say, well, we, we have this data and hey, here, here's how maybe we can apply it to this, this problem. Or, you know, we don't have the data that we, we might need to address this problem. How can we get it? Uh, so maybe having, having some, some people who have um, uh, at least one, one foot uh, in, the, in the issues in the, in the qualitative part of it, uh, to, to help make that bridge with, uh, as Debo mentioned, uh, to the people who are so strong in the quantitative part of, part of it. Yeah. Great, thanks. Any other comments, questions? Yep, I just wanna jump in. Um, I received a, a message in the chat to just um, mention that uh, open data shouldn't always be the goal from an indigenous perspective. And there's many reasons that that might be the case. Great. Thanks for that reminder. Pushing. Yeah, I just want to add quickly that also, I think with the current investment in the machine learning, data will become more important. So I'll say that. And I'll also, for folks who, who can't necessarily see the chat, there are, are two comments that have come through. Um, one from Brian uh, saying that simplifying data into visualization packets would be very helpful for those not well-versed in predictive modeling equations, statistical significance, and variability. Uh, so maybe the data manager should partner with creative people to make animated movies that can be posted broadly on social media platforms. Uh, and I'll, I'll just say that as a science communicator, I love that idea. Um, and then Ramey uh, mentioned that some may, may find the 1989 recording of Ursula Franklin's real world technology interesting, helpful, or handy. Um, speaking to however we identify one or another phenomena, person, event, et cetera, as legit. Um, and there's a, a link in the chat to that. Thanks for pointing out to those, um, Liz, and um, those, those comments will also be captured and, and passed on to the, the relevant team. Um, I, I also personally like data visualization and ways to communicate very complex issues um, in an accessible way. Any other comments, questions? It might be time soon for, um, we do have time probably for a question or two or a comment or two, but then um, I think we might need to move 
or it might be time to move into smaller breakouts, breakout rooms. Yeah, so seeing no more hands up, um, what we wanted to do for the last 25 minutes of this webinar was give folks the opportunity, if you would like it, to um, speak one on one or, or more directly with the transition team leaders who spoke today. Um, so we know that that breakout rooms are not uh, everyone's cup of tea. We're in no way, you know, requiring you to stick around and do this, but we are going to open up um, breakout rooms where folks can can hop in and uh, talk to, to the different leaders. Um, you will be able to move yourselves, so feel free to go to whichever room or rooms you are most interested 